Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have, I'm honored to have Ganesh Natarajan. Is it, and I've been practicing that for a second. He's co-founder of Minecraft, which is an outsourcing legal services company. They help international law firms and Fortune 1000 corporations with contracts, litigation support, legal research, compliance, and much more. They started in 2001. They now have over 500 employees in six offices across U.S. and India. Ganesh, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Looking forward to it. And so we were introduced by Manish. So how do you know Manish? He's on your board. Yeah, Manish and I met uh, 30 years ago almost when we both came from India, from Bombay, although we didn't know each other there. I guess it's Mumbai. I should use the word Mumbai today. It was Bombay then. Uh, we met at Brigham Young University. Oh. Where I came to do an MBA. He came to do an undergrad. And we were the few handful of Indian students at that point in time. This was early 80s. So that's how we met. Yeah. And we continued that friendship. And he's on our board. Yes. And we'll get to that. I want to know how you attract such a rock star board and members of your team in general. I always like to include a fun fact. And a fun fact about you is you like to imitate people. Yes. Yeah. And that's, you know... It's, it comes with more observation than anything else. So it's not so much the imitation, but the observation of little quirks that people yeah. have. And, uh, and and sometimes it's distracting, frankly. You know, I can be sitting in a actual business meeting and then I have my, my attention goes to that quirk that that person has. At the end, I'm going to ask you to imitate me. Be- Sorry? At the uh, end, I'm going to ask you to imitate me. Because uh, I, won't, I won't make you imitate your wife or someone else, but... I I can't see you completely, so it's hard to say. Um, (laughs) So I want to hear about, especially because you're you're from India originally, right? What were some of your big influences growing up and what shaped you? You know, it is hard to pinpoint to one person or one influence. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. Uh, Growing up in, in Mumbai in a big city, I think, was influential. Because, you know, if you haven't been there, it's extremely crowded. Uh, and you you have to sort of fight your way for resources. You got to sort of, you know, I should say, you should be, you need to be pretty innovative as to how you get, you know, what you need to get. And there is a resource scarcity, at least at that point in time, it was much worse than what it is now. So I think growing up in a big city environment did help me. Maybe street smart. I think that's the short, short term for it. But if I were to look at a person, I think it might be my grandfather, whom I grew up with, who perhaps was the most significant influence in my life as a child. Uh, and that continues today, you know, and his influence. And I think largely his influence resided because he helped me uh, value the art of public speaking, debating. Uh, things which have actually stood me in good stead today, you know. Uh, some of the skills I use from debating that I learned have been very useful in my business, even more so than some of the techniques and tools I learned in the useful to be very frank. Yeah, so what else did he teach you that you remember? Well, he, he also had a very broad uh, background himself. You know, he grew up in a relatively, in a small village in the southern part of India, relatively poor. But then he fought in World War Two, you know, with the Indian Air Force, uh, and then worked in countries in Europe and travel all through India, working as a civil engineer, you know, building roads and bridges when India was newly independent. Then shifted on to be an aeronautical engineer. Wow. So saw the beginning of aeronautics and aviation in India all the way through, you know, started life with a with a canvas back airplane to the Boeing 747. So he saw all of that. So he was a man of, you know, wide interests and wide talents. And although he was an engineer by nature and training and predisposition, he was also very much into poetry and literature and history. All those things, you know, were very useful. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you too um, about when you first came to the U.S., and what were some of the culture shocks and what you had to get used to. But 
first I have to ask, so why did you not decide to become an engineer like your grandfather? Why uh, law? Well, his influence stopped at one point because I was terrible at math. <laughs> I could just, uh, either, either maybe it's not him, but maybe the way it was taught. I just couldn't get a feel for math in the same way I could do with literature or history or mm -hmm. economics or any of the other subjects. Yeah. I think that's basically what it was. Yeah. So it wasn't that. What was it like when you came to the U.S.? What was a culture shock? What did you have to adapt to? Ah, that's a good question. Well, remember, you know, now then when people tell me, they ask me, you went to where? To Brigham Young in Utah, which is an obviously heavily Mormon, and other than a handful of us who were not Mormon, not only were we not Mormons, we were also from India, you know, so that was a <laughs> big, big difference. Uh, for me, the, the biggest shock was one of geography, you know, more than anything else. It was a wide open spaces in Utah that were mind boggling. The mountains. I grew up in the inner city of Mumbai, which is just a concrete jungle. And I had never actually seen anything like this until I showed up there. That to me was even today. And I, I think about those days and that I could sleep in my dorm room, look out of the window and see a 12,000 foot mountain, you know, with snow on top. Never seen that before. And it still jars me. You know, I go there from time to time. I'm actively involved with the school. And it's still, that to me was the biggest change. The rest of it was easier, believe it or not, you know, because the people were pretty friendly. Uh, and in, in a sense, you know, I didn't know any better when I came. I mean, I didn't really have any great sense of life in the U.S. So when you came without that kind of, other than what I saw in the movies, but I knew that's not real necessarily. Right. Other than without having those expectations, everything was okay. You know, it didn't really hit me, jar me in any way or the other. Way. How did you choose there, out of all places? Because you could go anywhere in the U.S. Why there? Yeah. No, I did get a scholarship. You know, so I got up close to a free ride. So that made a big difference. I is, could not have done it otherwise. So is that something you have to apply for, or do they do they like uh, recruit people? No, they don't recruit people. I mean, no. Things have changed. This was 30 years ago, you know, so without, before the internet and all that. So clearly you went to the, just, just as an aside, you know, you went to the U.S. Information Service Office in Mumbai. They had stacks of these college brochures on a wall and you pulled out these things and you went through them without any rhyme or reason. You know, I don't know why, yeah. you know, I didn't know why I was doing it. I just went through it. And frankly, I picked some of those ones based on how good those brochures looked. And the pictures on these. Brochures. How good what was? The brochures look. Oh, you know, yeah. And pictures and the pictures. So you, I remember opening the BYU one and they had a full, like a two-sided spread of the mountain, you know, and the mountains. And I go, wow, this is a beautiful place. So yeah. then I applied to a few other places really based on that. Yeah. But then they gave me a scholarship. Then I had a choice of some other places. They gave me a scholarship. So yeah. that. Was it hard to be away from your family, though? Because you're just still young and you're going off to a different country. No, it was. It was. And remember, there was no, no Skype, uh, no phone, you know, phone. We didn't have phones, no cell phones. And I actually didn't go back uh, for seven years. You know, really? I couldn't go back. So, one, it was expensive to go back. Number two, uh, you know, there were some... Then I went to law school, you know, after business school, I went to law school, so I stayed here, and then I only went back when I could sort of afford it. But that's... But since then, you know, since 90, 92, I've been going, you know, six, seven times a year to, for my business. So... And even when I was a lawyer. So that's changed. Changed quickly, but for the first seven years, it was different. So how was the transition from... You were a lawyer to then starting your company. When did you decide that you wanted to do your own thing? Even before I was, you know, I was a lawyer. I think I'd always wanted to uh, start something on my own. You know, be an entrepreneur, have the freedom that it that it allows in some ways. Uh, and then how this started was, we were, you know, I was with the law firm and I built an India practice for them. Uh, so I was doing a lot of deals in India. I was a transactional lawyer. And around the time, this coincided with India opening up its economy in 91. So allowing a lot of foreign investment to come to India. 
So a lot of my clients were U.S. companies who were going to India for varieties of wheat. You know, so we did lots of deals. And around the year 2000, we saw a lot of Indian companies come to the U.S. to serve that Y2K problems. You know, so software company, you know, largely mm-hmm. keeping. So it struck me and struck some of the co-founders that can we not do this in the law? You know, we felt that there's a lot of things that lawyers and law firms do that maybe need not be done by lawyers in the first place. Okay. That was the first premise. That was our first premise. Second premise What was, would be an example of that, just to give me an idea? So, you know, for example, you know, reviewing documents you know, for particular reasons, right? You look at mounds of litigation documents to see whether is this document relevant to the case. You know, and it can be nuanced, it can be complex, but do you need a law degree in order to do that? Perhaps not. But you need to have some background in the law. You need to have some understanding of where the lawyers want to take the case, what they want to do with it. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to do three years of law school and all of that. You know, So yeah. that was one, that was the first premise. The second premise then was, why can't we do this offshore? Because we can... We can sort of kill two birds there because we can actually find lawyers in India who are trained in the common law system, which is similar to us, and then we can add on our training fees to them, and they can do some of these these this kind of work. So that was a second thing that we focused on. Why? Because it gives a much better price. It's more cost effective. More cost effective. Much more cost effective. And remember, this was in 2000. The internet was there, but. Without the internet, this would not happen. Let me put it that way. This whole thing is enabled because of the internet, because we can now many other tools, you know, because of the web and how we can connect to each other. Uh, I mean, that's just proliferating. I don't want to get into that. Do you mean because you were working with U.S. companies and you were in India? Is that why it was so essential? That's right. That's right. And and our clients and our companies were everywhere. Right? They were not necessarily in Chicago. They were all over the country, in the, in the UK. So the connectivity was very important. Yeah. Uh, when I first came to the US, that this, this business was non existent, any of these things. So it's, it is part of the growth of connectivity. You know, yeah. When you first start your company, I know when you first start something, it doesn't always end up being, that's not what it looks like it, you know, now or five years or 10 years. What did you start, what services did you start off with and why did you choose them as opposed, and what did it grow into? No, that's a good question because we actually started with legal research uh, because that's where we felt, you know, for somebody to look at uh, you know, 50 state surveys, for example, in the US, you know, so you, or multi-country surveys. We had a client that was selling uh, products all over the world. They needed to know what were the laws, distribution laws in uh, 10 countries in Africa. So can you guys go find this research? You know, and we, we sent a team of people who did research on the web, calling those respective government institutions in Africa and putting together the research document. So that's the first cut. And then our, our client would take that and then either come back to us with more refinements or they would take it and do it. That's where we started. Yeah. But so who who did start with? Like, if I look at that, that seems like very labor and time intensive. Who's doing that research in the beginning? In the in, at that point, yeah. or, Then it was typically done by law for young lawyers and law firms. You know. I mean, um, did you hire on a, a, a staff at that point in, in India? Yeah. So, so I'll tell you what happened exactly yeah. you know, when we first started. We went and talked to some uh, clients, you know, my former clients, my law firm clients, uh, some general counsel in companies to say, hey, we have this idea. Do you think it works for you? Because you, you will, you know, we ex- expect that you will be a sort of an end client here. Yeah. But tell us something, you know, tell us about this idea, whether it works for you, doesn't work for you, what do you think? So we had lunch with one of those people in Chicago and laid this idea to her, and she goes, you know, I have a project for you. And at that point, we had nobody. We had two of us, you know. Right. We did the work. Right. So, uh, and then gave it to her and then expanded from there. So obviously, it was a good idea, you know. So, um, so that's smart. So you basically, you know, kind of got the client before you started to see is this a good idea and are you, will you be willing to pay for it? That's right. That's right. And, and 
you know, it, it's luck too, right? We didn't expect that to happen. We just started talking to them, and the next thing you know, the client said, I have a project for you. I remember looking at my partner going, you know, we got to do it now. <laughs> There's nobody else in the company. So that's really how it began. So what was the next service that you decided to offer, or and how did you get the next client? So the next one was, uh, well, there were many clients in this legal research uh, space. Because once we could sell to one, we could then go sell the same product to others. But then the next one was, the big one was litigation services, you know, where litigation support. Uh, now, this was very rudimentary offering in some ways. It was it's far more refined today, you know, in, in the last 12 years than it was then. Uh, because the technology has changed a lot, you know, and how people are viewing this. And the volumes of documents have grown up too, well, gone up too. Yeah. We did research where, well, I'm sorry, litigation support, where we went to clients and said, let's review your documents for particular issues, you know, whether it's relevance, whether it's privileged communication between attorney and client. So those kind, that was the next big one. Yeah. Was, and then branched off into other things, you know, subsequently. How did you make that jump, though? Because you're probably doing really well as a lawyer. And then when you start your own business, you're... You probably have assistants and, and people helping, and now you're just doing everything, and you're not, you know, probably making the same salary as you did before. How did you decide to make that jump? It was hard, you know. It was very hard, and I was a partner at a firm, so you know, it was long hours, yeah. but the pay was pretty good, you know. I said, right. But two things, right? One, I had not I, we, my my family, I think it's my wife and I had, uh, had built up a nest egg. So we figured out that, look, the worst thing, we can give it a shot. Worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work. Yeah. And I can go back to being a lawyer. Right. You know, and we time boxed it and said, let's give it uh, two years. You know, we said one year is too short. Uh, these things do take time to you know, take off. Yeah. Uh, let's give it two years. So that was the idea. And if it didn't work, in, work, uh, didn't work out in two years, I'd go back, back to being a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, so, so how did you meet your co-founders? Because you have there's four of you, right, that started the company. That's correct. So uh, a little bit of uh, professional, uh, you know, working together and some nepotism of some kind, you know. So I'll start with the first. I mean, George Heffern, he and I worked together at my law firm, McGuire Wood, and he helped me a lot on the Indian deal. So uh, in our long plane trips back and forth to India, we kept talking about these ideas, talking about these concepts. Yeah. We came across a lot of entrepreneurial companies in our legal work and liked what they did and felt that, so that's how we And the other two, uh, Rohan Dalal, who had the Indian operation, and Deju, the Pandey, who's here, uh, are friends, you know, friends of mine, all of whom know Manish as well. So it's, it's like a, a little circle of people. And we felt that we needed two of us who were lawyers and two who were non-lawyers to come in, you know, into the fold. Yeah. Uh, so both of them are engineers, but both have significant business experience. So that's how we put this thing. And when you and were, go early, ahead. early days, we felt the key element was could we trust each other? You know, that was number right. one. We had nothing else. Right? Yeah. How do you make key decisions? Because, you know, especially if you're a startup and you're trying to figure out what direction to go in and you have four people that have to agree, how did you come to those those decisions? You know, we, I, I'm knocking wood as I say this because we generally had pretty good agreement. You yeah. know, we never, uh, maybe the way because we all knew each other going into this, we knew, uh, you know, each strengths, weaknesses, and we knew each other well as individuals uh, and as friends. That there was a lot of respect for each other, so we never really faced those kinds of issues. You know? We never, never acrimonious throughout throughout the beginning. And how we decided was, you know, one of one would have an idea, then we talk about it. If we did agree, we'd say, "No, nah, we don't agree with it," and that that was for whatever reasons, uh, and and then move on, you know. And then if it's a good idea, we'd say, "All right, let's do it and go forward with it." Uh, so, you know, and we had sort of figured out different roles. I mean, it evolved into different roles. Right. I should sit down and figure out all these things. We did. Uh, so I focused a little more on some of the longer term issues. Uh, while George focused a little more on the legal aspects of what we were doing. 
at uh, that point you know in, in ensuring that legally substantively we are doing correct work and rohan in india actually focus on the delivery getting the job done getting the work done and they do focus a lot on the marketing of you know creating a market so we sort of evolved into different roles as as this progress that helped us yeah Hey, Ganesh, what uh, what do you think? What are some of the things that gave you the most traction and results with with growth of the company? Well, this is uh, tied into the funding story as well. So, okay, go ahead. Uh, the early years were tough, very hard, you know, because people had never heard of this legal outsourcing business. Right. Lawyers are conservative by nature and yeah. not prone to change, you know, yeah. as easily as quickly. Uh, so those were difficult years. Yeah. But around uh, the year 2004, we were able to land a big client in litigation. You know, so that helped us. And How then, did you get in the door? Uh, we were kept kept after them for a long time, and you know, kept going to meetings and meetings and meetings. And they kept saying, "Well, look, we have the work, we have the work, and it's not the right time." And basically, just that, you know, just persevering. You know, yeah. There was no, no you just kept calling. Just kept calling, just kept calling, you know, and then they and then they've been our client since. So you know, then the then the onus is on us to deliver good work, yeah, and then to add value to them. But then in 2006, we landed another client, a corporate client, uh, that also helped us a great deal. You know, we were able to uh, then build out the whole practice and build out a big office, uh, and had a lot of growth coming through. And this is where we needed the funding. So we got the funding. So that was the turning point. You know, that sort of in, was an inflection point. There. Yeah. So tell me about how did that funding work? Did someone approach you? Did did you go seek it out? Uh, we had ideas of getting the funding because we needed to fund for growth. Uh, you know, this because we needed to add so many people. We needed to build out an office in India, a much bigger office. Mm-hmm. All those issues, right? So, so we had to do this, and so we knew we had to raise money. But how it happened was very interesting. We didn't really do a traditional sort of round of funding uh, where we went and did road shows and things like that. We didn't do any of that. At my son's school here in Chicago, there was another guy, another parent, who I knew was some, had something to do in the financial world. I didn't really know exactly what. But I knew that he had some fund of some kind, so I casually mentioned to him, saying, "Hey, Dave, uh, you know, he knew what I was doing because we had to chat it." Right, him. like on the soccer field, you're chatting about business yeah, or something. Yeah, you know, like you know, what do you do? And you know, I explained. Yeah, and I said, "Hey, you know, we're looking for to raise some money. Do you know of anybody? You know, any venture funds in Chicago or wherever?" Two days later, he called me and said, "You know, we might be interested." Hey, uh-huh. so. And that's it. You know, we didn't do anything. We just went with it. <laughs> Very good, good partner. So, so the team has you to thank because in my research, I was I read talent asset management in 2006. You actually, uh, you know, raised four million dollars in funding. Yes, yes. So we raised four million, and they are a minority investor. Uh, and and it's been a very very good partnership for us. Yeah. Know, so. So I guess when in doubt, go to uh, your son's soccer and uh, just ask around. I guess you know, you know, a lot of life it's is serendipity, right? You don't really yeah. know, and these things, these things just happen. And they've been exceedingly good partners for us, and uh, it's been great. You know, so no, uh, no question. So when you get that amount of funding, what do you do next? You said you built out some offices. What was what were some of the things that you did to grow after that? Well, we we in India we have a forty-five thousand square foot facility. Wow, you know, a big big investment into the facility and building that out and all that. And then we had to add people. So the next step was to add a lot of people, built out more marketing and sales. You know, we had we didn't really have a sales team until then, other than us running around trying to sell this thing, sell our services. But now we have a bigger sales team and all of that. So. That was that money was used to really build out the sales and marketing engine, as well as the delivery organization. So, what have you found that works with the sales and marketing engine for a company right now is listening who they're trying to grow? What have you done well with that sales and marketing engine that would help them? 
we we made some mistakes. You know, this this may be one of the big mistakes we made along the way. We didn't really know exactly how to do this. You know, to be very frank, we were we were trying to figure this out, and we did have a lot of trial and error along the way. And this this is perhaps the mistake we made. Uh, it is also a sort of axiomatic that it's very difficult to find good sales number. If if I were to say what is your biggest challenge, I think from a people point of view that is the biggest challenge, and as a business, selling is always the biggest. Challenge. You know, it's always. I mean, that never really goes away. Right. Irrespective of whatever size you are, uh, you know, you can be IBM, and that's still a challenge. You know, so that's there. But we didn't quite know exactly the profile of the sales people that we needed, mm-hmm. partly because. We just didn't know, you know. Our industry was new; nobody had done this before, so it wasn't like a blueprint that we could follow. Uh, we couldn't just sit down and pull some job descriptions from the internet and say, "Ah, okay," tweak it and say, "This is mine." There was no nothing like that. So that was the hard yeah, part. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that you were one of the first out legal outsourcing companies. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we didn't have a, any roadmap. You know, we had to sort of. Figure this out. Uh, hindsight, and you know, obviously, I can look back and say what we should have done. <laughs> but what we what we did was, and then that's number one. And the second thing was our clients were not as refined purchasers as they are today. Uh, so what do you mean by that? So by that I mean today, we, when we go talk to a corporate client. We are not only talking to lawyers in that organization. You know, you're talking to procurement people. You're talking to heads of businesses. Uh, you're talking to. Could, they could be lawyers. You know, they could be lawyers heading lines of businesses. But it's not just the legal department. Mm-hmm. It is a more of a broad-based sale. And then when you move into places which, say, it's a big, you know, top five bank in the world, they are pretty sophisticated purchasers of professional services generally. Yeah. So they extend all of those methodologies and frameworks. That they've used to buy professional services to us, although we are newer in this in this game, they have done that a lot, and they yeah. extend that to us. So, so, what were some of those things? So, for example, uh, now you know we do a lot of work through RFPs and RFIs. You know, that's how we get a lot of our work. Uh, you know, it's through request for proposal, request for information, uh, and there's a whole procurement group. Of you know, uh, arm of people that come into play who have their own methodology of how they go through the RFI, what information do we need to show them, what information do we need to uh, give them, how many rounds that we have to go through with them, how do we show up for each round. We, in fact, had a client recently that did an e-auction, you know, to purchase services, professional services. Really? They auctioned, they, they auctioned it off? Yes. It's a reverse auction. So you've got a big Below, down, you know, you don't bid up like a normal. Auction. Oh, I see. But it's an auction, you know. It's it's on the web, you know. It's on everybody's on, and you got to be quick, you know. You got to be bidding, you know, through this process. Now that was the end process, end result. You know, they vetted us through a lot of steps we had to go through before we ended up in the auction. Yeah. But that would never have happened. Uh, that never happened when we first started. You know, this this kind of stuff never existed. Yeah. So there's a whole. Different way in which we sell today than we first started. You know, we have an inside sales team that actually calls and sets up appointments for our business development people. Our business development people in the early days were just purely sales guys who would sell projects. Now we have experienced people, you know, seasoned guys who are selling relationships. Yeah, that's a big shift. Yeah, we don't sell projects anymore. Yeah, in a relationship. So it's very systemized. So what, what does it, the system look like? If someone inside sales calls a company, and then what? Well, before that, we have, we have targets, right? We figure out target list that the inside sales team should call. Mm-hmm. And that's based on each line of business, and over the years, we we know where the, the work is. And we then we've also gotten very focused in focusing on financial services, life sciences, law firms, and uh, technology. You know, that's sort of our four focus areas. So earlier, we used to basically go after everybody, you know. So because there was a time when George and I would be sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. So right. Whoever rang, we'd say, "Sure, you know, we'll do it." 
that's changed. You know, it's not that we won't. I'm not saying we won't. But we do look for can we build relationships? You know, is this a one-off kind of thing? Mm-hmm. You want a long-term, long-term client. That's it. So inside sales calls uh, based on this target list. And we have, you know, they call and set up meetings for specific people. So we have uh, a salesperson who is tagged with an inside sales person, you know. So, uh, or uh, actually two, two business development people who are tagged with one inside sales person and in one line of business, you know, focusing on one industry. So it's very targeted, focused, uh, and the people we have are experienced. They're right? very, their expertise is right in line with that. And, in line. and that's a lesson we learned along the way. You know, now that I think about it, maybe we should have done that earlier, but we didn't know. You know, it's simple as that. You know, it's, it's, sometimes we make, uh, most of the time, we make mistakes because we just don't know. You know so, right. Uh, do they have the authority then at that point, once those people go in to talk with the client, do they have the authority to kind of come negotiate with what the, the price is or do they have to go back to someone senior to say, this is what what the client wants, you know, the, the proposal? Parameter that they're given, yes, they can, you know, but if it's outside of those parameters, then they have to come and talk to our CFO or somebody, you know, so, but then they also, it's, they go in, but when they go in, remember, it's multiple presentations we have to make, so the, our operations and delivery guys tag along at some point, mm-hmm. because at some level, it, you, know, you go in and you say, this is the wonderful thing Minecraft can do for you. But then the client goes, all right, that's all great, but let me bring me the person who's actually going to do it. Because I know you, sales guy, you're going to tell me all these things. Right. You, CEO, you're going to come and give me the big song and dance and you'll disappear tomorrow. Who's going to do the work? Bring right. them in front of me. So there's a whole process yeah. to it. How we do which. Yeah. You know. And I ask this, these questions again, Ash, is like business people, this is, I'm listening, I'm leaning in, I'm listening very carefully. For people who don't care about business, this is probably boring them. But yeah. but I feel like these systems are like so essential to to business and success. So that's why I ask kind of these these real detailed questions. No, it's a good question because again I say this might be the biggest mistake we made, which is perhaps we should have done this earlier in the cycle, you know. But uh, or maybe we should have gotten help from somebody. Yeah. That's the other lesson I've learned is, you know, there are people out there that who can say, look, from my experience, this is how it works in professional services, guys. I know your industry is new, but it's not, I mean, it's not that, you know, the, the lessons learned from other industries are applicable right. to us, other services are applicable to us, and maybe that's, we should have done that earlier, you know, but all that sense. Of, so. And you have, you know, the other thing that, that comes to mind, and I want to find out where the, the name came from, Minecraft, yeah. but um, you have six offices, over 500 employees. What are some of the processes you use for finding, hiring, and training great people? Because that's a tough, some people have a hard time doing that for one employee or two, and you have over 500. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a holistic process, first of all. You know, you really cannot look at, at some level, you know, at, at at some level, you have to look at the whole thing, right? Right from the recruiting, how do you bring people through the door, yeah. all the way through how do you develop their careers. You know? And you got to look at the entire spectrum. Uh, or at least I and our senior management team looks at it there. Right. So there are mul- different things you do, though, because how we recruit, we recruit from law schools as well as you know experienced people. In the U.S., we tend to go after experienced people because that's what we need here. Yeah. Uh, you know, because the kind of work we do in the U.S. is more expertise-driven, so we go after experienced people. Mm-hmm. In India, it's more the law school approach that yeah. we get. And over the years, we've developed our own testing tools, our own tests that we provide our people. Uh, we have a whole interviewing mechanism that we do. Mm-hmm. In the U.S., we also, and in India, we use some recruiting firms and headhunters to follow people to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, because again, this is a this is a function of size as well. We just couldn't afford to do all this in the beginnings of right. uh, But you know, today we have a full professionally staffed HR team with help from outside resources that right. does all. This. Yeah, but it didn't start like that. What no, was something you did earlier on that was very effective? That was one test that everyone. If you're hiring an employee, this is you should be using this test. 
Uh, you know, the the, the 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 test was not anything written. I mean, we assume that people have the expertise and skill at least in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But the question I always view. Remember, when we started, we were much more entrepreneurial. You know, and still are. I hope. But uh, clearly, very entrepreneurial. So we wanted people who were very nimble in their thinking. Yeah. And it only comes out of conversation. You know, you can't really put down on a test and say answer yeah. this test for that. Uh, even today, we look for people who are very nimble and who can quickly change tack. You know, who are not so set in their ways that yeah. if you, they are just going to follow one path. And, How do you and, tell and, that? Huh? How do you tell that from someone? Uh, it's difficult. It is very difficult. You know, in the beginning, it was some some element of trial and error. We've had people that we've hired in senior roles in the company. And very soon we find, you know, they are just not able to get off their 15 years of learning, to unlearn some of that mm -hmm. and get in with what we are trying to do and get, more importantly, get to with what our clients are trying to do. Yeah. It's really not what Linkless wants. It's really how our clients think and how we should move quickly to capitalize on it and and you it's very hard to test for it but I, I, among young people you know college you know, law school grads mm -hmm. uh, you do look for a sort of a background that they have which is a more broad-based background what successes have they had and different things that they've done mm -hmm. it need not be resounding successes it could also be failures you know they, it could be people who've tried something or the other even if it's, uh, you know, something like singing, you know, I don't care what it is. People who have the desire to try different things, right. even if they fail, that's fine. And you can see that, you know, in their resumes, you can see in the conversations. Or are there people who had stellar grades, have done wonderfully in school, but they just can't think themselves out of a box. You know? mm -hmm. That's the, right. for me, that is very important. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, that you know now you guys do really well, very successful company. But before, when you first started, it was there were hard times. What was a low point that you remember? Oh, I remember this vividly. You know, so uh, we were on a family vacation with some friends uh, in uh, Victoria Island, you know, in uh, Canada. And I remember the whole and a lot of kids, you know, a lot of bunch of friends. Everybody had little, little children at that point in time. And we all went to a big, uh, some botanical garden or some beautiful garden. You know, right? I don't remember the name because as soon as we entered that garden, and we were bidding for a huge project. At that time, it required 50 people, which was massive for us. You know? 50 people? 50, yeah. At, at that time, we I, I can't remember the day, maybe 2004, 2003. At that point, we were about 15 people. Wow. So, 50 people deal was huge. Yeah. So, we were, you know, we thought we had it and we had indications from the client that we had it. And as soon as we entered into that botanical garden or whatever that garden was, I got a call on my cell phone. It was one of the flip phones. I flipped it and I heard and they said, no, you didn't get it. Oh. So, I, you know, that was the lowest point because we were all, you know, uh, where is the next piece of work going to come from? Because we knew we couldn't sustain ourselves at 15 people. We couldn't, you know, we just couldn't do it. We had to get up to the next level. That was tough. And I, the rest of that trip was just a blur. I don't even remember the garden. Because I remember saying, everybody, you guys go ahead and sitting there. You had you to know, take a moment. Something was wrong. She knew what was right there. But that was, that was, that was tough. so I called our partners and said, you know, and, this is a problem. So, but, How do you get over that? Because like you said, when we hit those low points, you know, we need to kind of bring ourselves up and it's tough at that point. What did you do to get over that hump and just get that next client? Uh, you know, to be very honest, it helps to have a good family structure. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody you can talk to within the family, ideally your spouse or somebody else, if you're not married. Because they are the closest to you often and they can sense these things. All good friends, I shouldn't say, just friends. Can be people. And Manish was there, you know, that, that, and his brother Ketan was there too. So I, and I talked to my wife, I talked to them, and there were people who could immediately put things in perspective, you know, which is, look, 
these things happen. I mean, these happen in life. I mean, in the spectrum of things, this is not as bad. You know, right. to be honest, to go through much worse. But you need somebody to put things in perspective because right. at that point in time, you don't have control. Right. But it's it's so devastating that like anything, you know, like all these things. Right? Yeah. And you need that somebody to put it in perspective, and if yeah. you get that. Then you get up and say, "All right, what other choice do you have?" To? And then at some point, it does become something else altogether. You know, today when I think of these things, I think I have some uh, uh, not allegiance, yeah, maybe the allegiance is the word, but the responsibility towards all five hundred of those people. Right. You know, it's no longer just you that you're trying to do, but you know, you see somebody. Come into the organization, build a family, and grow. Yeah, and it gets a good feeling. You know, you feel wow, yeah. it, that's nice. We have somebody in, the, in in Chicago who moved here from New York, a young person. Yeah, and uh, they got married, and two weeks ago they had a child, and you go, you oh, know, that's great. You know, so there's a different sense of responsibility now. Yeah, than we had before. Yeah. That gives you that greater purpose, and you have to push through because you know you have to support all these families and people. I, so that goes on, you know, you said it's really important to, to have people, a support system. Who are some of your mentors and some of the best advice they've given you? Uh, you know, other than my, my dad and my grandfather and close family, my mother's spouse, you know, they've all been there throughout the world. Uh, but other than that, you know, I do have... Uh, a few people that I lean on for different things. You know, it's not like it's all one. Uh, because, you know, Ketan and Manish have been very helpful in understanding, helping me understand the ups and downs of being an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. They also went through some difficult times. It wasn't easy for them. And I was involved in their company right from the beginning. So, so we I've seen that with them and how they've gone through that. And so they've been good guys in saying, look, at the end of the day, it is what it is. You know, you, you can only worry about these things so much and you have to let go at some point. Yeah. So they've been good mentors. And then I've had, you know, in the board, one of the guys on our board has been a very good mentor. So uh, we have lots of conversations. Yeah. What did, what advice has he given you? Uh, no, you know, this he's a finance guy, you know. So, this, you know, I should say despite being a finance guy, but obviously, you know, Numbers are important to him, and achieving targets are important to him, and he will push for that. And that's his job on the board. But he he comes from a broader perspective. You know, he takes a, a, a seat that look, we got to try everything to hit these numbers. But you know, if it doesn't happen, let's figure something else out. Yeah. So it's the perspective. It's all a question of getting the right perspective. And then I have another guy who helps me out on the sales side. You know, because he's written books. He's a sales guru. He's written books on sales. Some of the stuff he tells me doesn't necessarily work for us, uh, but I wish I had known him earlier. As I said, you know, told you. He is one guy I wish I had known earlier. Which you one? Know. Which one? The sales, the sales guy. Oh. Know, how to how to put together a sales team? Because he's been informally talking about the professional services sales. Mm-hmm. He's not. A, he doesn't come from the legal background at all. Who was but, that? Who is that on your board? You're talking. Uh, about? No, he's not on the board. Oh, he's not on the board. So, just a friend. Yeah. And th- that was a, the next question I was gonna. I was thinking about when I was looking through your site. I'm like, wow, like you have a rock star group of board of directors. How did you attract them and get them on board? I see how you attracted a few of them. You're, you know, two of you, you know, are founders of the company, and then Manish. What about the other two? How did you attract well, those? One is somebody uh, from talent, you know, from. The investment group. And the other person was somebody who was very senior, who had a lot of experience in outsourcing, uh, you know, in, in sort of a large transformative outsourcing then. He worked, uh, he, had lots, he had lots of careers actually, but his last was helping uh, do all the fleet management for companies, you know, so all of the cars, the travel and fleet management. So complete outsourced travel. So we thought he would be a good guy. To guide us through this, and and he is a generation older, you know. So we felt that we needed somebody with uh, more gray hair. And I have enough now. But more. <laughs> you don't have that much right now. Yeah. 
That was, that's um because I was looking through those. I think you're talking about Walter, yeah, and right. I was looking through. I'm like, yo, he was head of Yo Play, the actual yogurt. Yes, he introduced Yo Play to the U.S. That's so. That's <coughs> so. How did you get in connection with him? Uh, through Bill uh, and some other people I know, you know, so friends of mine that got connected to him and. And he he did something innovative, right? Because uh, he, you know his background. He was with Sarah Lee, you know, he's one of the top executives. He's been in the food business for a long time. <coughs> and with YoPlay, if you remember, YoPlay had that upside down cup. You know, most cups go this way, and YoPlay had that this kind of thing. Right. Uh, inverted triangle in some ways, you know. That was a claim to fame because it looked very different from every other yogurt. Flavor cup. Mm-hmm. So, and he did something that was totally new, you know, which nobody had done before, I guess. Uh, and French yogurt, you know, stuff like that. So he, I don't know if it was actually French. Maybe the name sounds French. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, and then he moved on to different careers. So he's, you know, he's been a the uh, wise man. Yeah. So, so, what good advice has he given you throughout the years? To be focused. You know, do not lose focus. You know, because there are lots of things that a lot of people want you to do. You walk into a client, and and they will raise. You know, hey, can you do this for me? Right. Or that for me? Don't get sucked in. You know, if it doesn't fit exactly with our plan and yeah. what you want to do, you're better off walking away from it. And that is constantly reminded. It takes a lot of discipline. It's not easy, especially with the sales team. It's not easy because they'd rather do anything. You know. Uh, because that's the nature of the sales guy to sort of build whatever, wherever they can get business. The hard part is to say no, so not something. It's hard to say that because especially when you go through all this work to get the business and they want you to do extra stuff. So how do you, how do you decide where the gray area is where you say no or you you do what they they want? You know, it's almost a gut check for us. Number one, number one. first is we well, we look at is this does this fall within our skill set. Across the company, I and can make an. You could probably make an argument for. Yeah, we could figure this out. You know. Yeah. So then the question is, then it's a. That's where the gut check comes in, which is how well can we figure this out, and how, what kind of product or service that can we deliver where we can say we can deliver to hundred percent quality. Mm-hmm. We have no reputational loss, and if there is a doubt there, our feeling is maybe we shouldn't do it now. Unless we add to the team, we bring in that expertise from somewhere. Right, I see. If we don't have it, either you can say no or you bring it from somewhere. Yeah. That then there's the next level of decision making that goes through. But Walter is very good at saying, stick stick to it. You know, stick to your focus. Don't get sidetracked. With all these things. Uh, you know, you'll get in a lot of trouble. Later. So what is going to? What's one of your best pieces of advice for someone who wants to grow their organization? You know, to me, ultimately, it all boils down to people. You know, it's the team uh, more than anything else. Uh, the ideas are great. You know, people have great ideas. You won't even be an entrepreneur if you don't have great ideas. You know, I, you can sit in a lot of entrepreneurs, and every day ideas come. To you, you know, so idea is not the issue. But you need the team to execute. You know, you need the yeah. team. Ultimately, it's a question of execute. Yeah, and a team that you can trust completely. Where you can actually have robust discussions, but at the end of the day, agree on. And I think that is really what it boils down. And yeah. that's not easy. Uh, yeah. So, what have you not, found that helps pe- lead people to execute? Because that is not easy. Yeah, I mean, the the, the it's actually finding the right team is not easy. Also, you know, I mean, but today the execution becomes a little bit easier because we're much bigger, you know, and we have. People with very specific roles, right? Who are tasked with very specific things that they have to execute. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's easier in a sense. In that sense, maybe it is even harder if you grow into a huge company, you know, because it's much, much uh, amorphous in that way. But in a in a day in and day out sense, it's actually easier for us now than it was earlier because although yeah. we wear multiple hats at the lower levels of the organization, there are very specific. Uh, plans, targets, objectives that people have, the goals people have to reach. So it becomes a little bit easier. You know, the early stage is harder because 
that's where the focus comes to yeah. execute. You don't have focus, you cannot execute. Yeah. Because you're running in 15 different directions all the time. What was the growth like? You know, you went from four people and then how did how did it jump up? So in, in 2005, 2006, we would have been about, you know, about 100 people. You know, we jumped like four, 15, 20, 30, 200. And then ramped up from there, steadily grew to today, you know, to 500. Or so. What was the that number that it just jumped the biggest? I think we jumped from about 25 to 100 of them. Oh, wow. So that was a good do you find that to be looking and talking to your mentors and other people? Is that typical when you hit a certain inflection point? It tends to jump at that point, or, or is everyone different? No, it, it tends to. I think I think in the course of a company, it is almost like a step function. You know, you you sort of grow steadily, then you jump. You sort of grow steadily, then you jump. So yeah. it, it's. I think it's never. You know, I mean, if you're, you're lucky to have steady hockey stick kind of growth. But it doesn't happen because there are changes in the marketplace that take place. Mm-hmm. So, a recession happened. For us, you know. Right. Yeah. So how did that affect you? Uh, it flattened everything. You know, we we grew a little. You know, but it, we kept growing. But it wasn't the kind of growth we had before, yeah. or the growth we see now. Well, how did you do that? Because most people obviously didn't. They didn't even grow a little bit. They went the opposite direction. Yeah, because we had, uh, you know, we had sort of minimum numbers of people working on our clients. And then that got added, you know, one or two clients we added every year and that kept going. You know, so You're kind of diversified a little bit? That's right. Diversified a little bit and that helped. Us. But clearly people were not de- stopped making all decisions regarding investment you know, once the recession. So how did you come up with my, the name Minecraft? Well, we actually originally wanted to come uh, create a knowledge management company uh, with a big portal that would have all uh, soft and hard knowledge of, in a corporation put into the portal that people could use. <clears throat> and we tried to say to law firms that, you know, you if you have a memo on a particular subject, you don't have to reinvent that memo every time. It's all in the system. So we had the idea of mind you know, in, 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 the, in, our, in our mind. Right. And then the crest is sort of the, the knowledge cresting, you know, the height of that knowledge. Mm-hmm. So we kept it. So that's basically it. I thought you were going to say when you were Brigham Young, you looked out the window and you saw this big mountain or something and then right. it became no. Minecraft. No, 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 that too. But it is similar, similar in concept. And then if you notice that eye, you know, which we have, it's like a little flame, you know, uh, that, that our logo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That actually denotes in India, it denotes that this, the, the tika that people wear on their foreheads, which is the inner eye, you know, it's not ah. the, yeah, but the inward looking eye, which is also a font of knowledge. So it's all of that. I like that. Um, so what are some of your daily rituals that make you productive? Obviously, you're running a huge organization. What do you do that we should also be doing that, you know, kind of keeps you on track during your day, makes you productive? Well, you know, I don't know if this is good or bad, but I'm heavily scheduled. Yeah. You know, so I think I resisted this for a long time uh, because it's not my nature to be, you know, stuck to a schedule every day because I. That's not where I came from. You know, most I think most entrepreneurs have difficulty with this kind of stuff. Right. You, you are an entrepreneur because you want the freedom. Right. But I think that helps a lot. You know, and I've learned it along the way. I have resisted, made my displeasure known, but it's harder and harder to do that. But that helps yeah. because you have a day, and then, then I do sort of allow myself some time to think, which is actually a rarer and rarer commodity. Uh, I find that to be one of the difficult things to accomplish, but I do think it's important. Uh, like a meditation, or just just sitting, just sitting there and thinking. Yeah, just, you know, actually even with a pad and a pen, you know, just to write some of the thoughts that you have about the business, about broader, bigger issues that we need to think about. <coughs> even if you put it away, you know, and then look at it later on, I think it's a useful exercise to go through. Uh, that's, you know, two things I would say. And then <coughs> I travel a lot. 
uh, you know, for work and meeting clients. Maybe it's one thing I do, which I, I don't see many others doing these days. I don't do anything on plane. You know, I actually don't do any work. I try to use that to, you know, rejuvenate or even think through some of these things mm-hmm. as opposed to doing anything. You know, I, on my long trips to India, I purposely don't do it. Maybe I can say this, but I don't do it. I try not to do it anymore. Unless it's okay. What's built in your schedule that we should also be doing? That you're heavily scheduled with? Is there something like, is there a certain time of day like before you go to bed that you do the thinking or you're writing on your pad? What I'm just thinking, what should I be doing that's in your habits? You know, one thing that's helpful to me, which is sort of unrelated to my work, mm-hmm. is reading. You know, I do read a lot. Mm. Uh, every day, you know, before going to bed. You know, I may not jot down anything, but I do read. So what are some of your favorite books? Uh, I tend to read hi- history more than anything else, uh, biographies, mm-hmm. and uh, non-fiction, mm-hmm. travel, uh, stuff about other places. You know, that's the way for me to sort of take my mind away to some far-off place. Mm-hmm. And travel. So those are some of the things I. You know, Do you have a favorite biography? Uh, lots of them. I mean, there have been the, the trilogy on uh, Teddy Roosevelt that mm-hmm. I like a lot. Uh, there are multiple Lincoln biographies. Uh, yeah. General MacArthur, you know, the, what is it, the American Caesar. I think that's the name of that. Mm-hmm. There's lots of them. Yeah. And Truman. I mean, many, many. Yeah. I have one last question. I appreciate your time. But before I ask it, I want you to tell people a little bit about where they can find Minecraft, what's going on now, what's new and exciting. Sure. We uh, are, you know, www.minecraft.com. Yeah. As it says. Uh, we are actually opening a much bigger office in New York, you know, May 1st. You know, so that should, Congrats. That should be uh, a good thing. And we are... Right by Trinity Church, going back to history, that's where Alexander Hamilton was buried. So, right facing the church in, in New York City, downtown New York. Wow. Uh, and we are actually you know, hiring quite a bit you know, in the U.S., particularly. Uh, so, where are the offices for people who don't know? Where are the offices in the U.S.? So, Chicago, New York, D.C., San Francisco, uh, and then in India, in Pune, and Bombay. So, those are the and then we are um, uh, hiring people right now for experienced people in business development, account management, executive roles. So we'll see that in, in different forms. It'll appear. So that's, we are growing, you know. So that's great. Percent growth every year, so that's a good thing. And we are expanding our presence in the U.S. as well. So, and sorry, Salt Lake City is another area. A lot of us Salt Lake City. You know, that's exciting. It's delivery center in Salt Lake City. Going back to my roots of your Brigham Young days. So, my last question, Ganesh, for you is: you know, we talked about some of the challenges, the low points. What's a, a proud moment after going through all this journey? This journey. Uh, I. It's a sort of a strange one, but you know, maybe a few years ago, I was in India in an Indian office, and. Uh, we had an employee come and say, hey, you know, I'm going on vacation. She was one of our early employees. In my so I was sort of chatting with her, where are you going? And she was going to some place, you know. And I said, oh, great. And uh, she said, how are you getting there? You know, she goes, I'm flying. So I thought, oh, nothing, nothing about it. And she looked at me and you know, this is my first time in a plane. Wow. So excited. And I felt very proud that, you know, the fact that, she worked for us, and now she could afford to do something like that, yeah. which I take for granted, you know, often. Uh, right. It's pretty proud, you know, and there yeah. are many stories, you know, individual stories that make you feel proud. What about on a selfish standpoint? What have you been able to do or because of this company that you, you know, put your sweat and, and blood into? Well, travel is one thing I have been able to do, you know, speaking in the same vein. Because uh, I do travel a lot, mm-hmm. and I do try to take some time wherever I go to look at one thing. You know, even if it's uh, one day at some place, I'll try to 
figure out catching play, see a museum, even just walking around, uh, something, you know, in, in whichever city I go to, that's how to do it. So I have pretty much traveled all over the US. There are two states left to me. I've been everywhere else. So, and many countries. So that's been a good luxury. Yeah. I just want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're heavily scheduled. Yeah. So thanks for fitting me in your schedule. And if I ever meet you in Chicago, I want to see up front one of your imitations. So okay. I appreciate your time. All right. Thanks thank so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ari.